Welcome to Goliath. I'm here with Jonathan Berry, the CEO and founder of Goliath, and we're going to be talking a little bit about what Goliath is. How are you doing, John? I'm doing well. How are you, Chris? I'm good. I'm good. So tell me, so we sat down for breakfast many months ago, and you painted a picture of Goliath for me. Uh, I was hoping you could do the same here, because I think it is a very compelling future vision of, of where the IoT industry is going to be. Yeah, and oh boy, a few months ago, <laughs> feels like a lifetime ago. It does. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, when we were chatting, we were just kind of commiserating on our own experiences building IoT products at different companies, you for your clients um, more recently, uh, and really just like the hard parts of IoT and what makes IoT hard. Uh, and honestly, it depends who you are, right? If you are a hardware company, um, manufacturing devices and uh, getting assembly lines and doing, you know, PTCRB testing, those are actually things that you know how to do. Uh, but kind of the genesis for Goliath is the things that those companies are not well-versed in, and that's all the cloud stuff. And for me, it, it was eye-opening working in at all these cloud companies and, and starting to build more cloud-connected devices, just how how hard the cloud parts are for building connected devices. Right. Yeah, and as, as a hardware engineer talking to you about it too, you started bringing up things that I'm, I'm just like, I, I don't even think about these things, honestly. Like, I'm just like, oh yeah, well, you know, at some point someone gives me an endpoint and, you know, I can yeah. write some kind of code and throw some kind of packet at it and it's just, it's going to work. But, but there's basically a whole other set of people and layers kind of in between there. And that's where the pain starts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, from a harder perspective, right? Let's say you have a like a dev kit, right, or a, a device you've designed. Uh, talking to a serial port, right, is just throwing packets over the uh, over to the peripheral, and then it's someone else's problem. Uh, the big part of IoT, which makes it different than everything else in hardware, is that it's actually everyone's problem. It's one giant connected system. So the fact that that server is working and the security model for that device to talk to that server is is you know all good um, means the packet will get there. But if it doesn't, you don't know, and then the entire house of cards falls apart. And so how are you as a the hardware person supposed to be able to understand everything that's happening in the cloud in order to, to know that that packet got there or that you're doing the right thing? Um, and so it's this complexity that has to be you know, encapsulated by every, uh, everyone who's working on a connected product. Um, and if you're just doing the, you know, the device bring up, uh, you know, the you know, RF uh, tuning, uh, even just you know, getting the display working for whatever you're building, you actually have to have the cloud there because <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot yeah. of it is, is, is needed there from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and that means you have to understand databases and VMs and AWS consoles, or you have someone on your team who, who knows that stuff too. Um, but that is, that's like, we're going out the wrong way, right? Like that, that, that blocks your productivity that requires you to become a cloud expert just to do the hello world of IoT, which is to send a temperature data somewhere. Another thing I think about that we talked about is the, the fact that once you've decided on these things, once you've started down this path, that it's kind of more vertically integrated than it has been in the past. So if I am going to set up that screen or do that serial port or all of the other things in there, whatever OS I pick, whatever, you know, if I'm bare metal, all these things, it's so tied together that you might basically design yourself into a corner and then you're like, and then you finally talk to the network person or the web, the cloud engineer, and they're like, well, actually, no, we're, we're, we can't work with that. And then you have to yeah, kind of yeah. build all this middleware in the middle. Yeah, um, uh, a company that I, I met with a long time ago, uh, and I caught up with recently, uh, they build a cellular connected thing. Um, and that cellular connected thing is uh, owned by the hardware team. They have a fantastic set of engineers, ex, ex big companies building lots and lots of hardware. Um, and when they actually got acquired and joined this larger company that is now trying to commercialize this connected thing, um, also with engineers from big companies who know everything about clouds and servers and databases. And when they had their first technical uh, conversation of, hey, how do, we, how do we integrate our hardware with your, your fancy cloud, um, it was pretty awkward, uh, in part because they, they said, we have no idea how to talk to a cellular device. We know oh. servers, <laughs> and, and we know web pages. Um, oh. what, you, you, speak, you speak HTTP, right? This, this standard protocol that all the other devices That's use. Right, yeah. uh, like, no, 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 we're, we're a cellular device. We, we, we pay for... Bandwidth, uh, we have to have a very compressed uh, protocol and, and be very sensitive to how we talk to the cloud. And do you speak protocol X? And they're like, we don't even, 
there's more than just HTTP. Yeah. Um, right. And so it, you know, that was like months of designing and trying to integrate. Um, and when they got to the point where they had a prototype of something, um, they're like, okay, well, we need to securely talk to your servers. Uh, can you give us a certificate to sign our messages? Right. Um, and they said, yes, here, here's the same certificate we use for mobile devices. And it used up, you know, it was like a like a gigabyte of RAM or something crazy, uh, where this tiny microcontroller-based cellular thing, yeah. you know, has 120k, right? And so it was a complete impedance mismatch. And this is the, this is my favorite term that uh, I stole from from that team between the world of hardware and connecting that hardware, to, to, you know, to the cloud, and the world of cloud trying to connect tiny devices to to what they're used to for for big servers. And um, that's sort of been the guiding light for a lot of our thinking is how do we how do we fix that impedance mismatch how do we make cloud software but built for hardware and hardware teams that's that's sort of the the beginnings of, of goliath so is that what you'd say goliath is is the is the cloud is the hardware what is what is goliath in in the the core pitch of goliath yeah so we're definitely trying to solve the cloud problems for hardware and so that means we're a software company and we provide cloud services that your devices can use to be, build out your connectivity and connected um, um, solution. And so we don't make hardware, we, but we support hardware. And so we have hardware partners like chipset vendors and module vendors. Um, but at the end of the day, you firmware engineer, you electrical engineer who's writing firmware because you're at a startup, or the rogue mechanical engineer who has to do the PCB design. Um, the bad boy in the mechanical space, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you, I, I know one of you are watching. Um, you take our SDKs and we help facilitate all the connectivity and, and kind of abstract away that cloud um, so that you can do the things that you want to do with your connected uh, connected device to connect with the Goliath cloud. So it's a mix of uh, software SDKs and these services that are, are built by us and managed by us that you don't have to, um, you don't have to build yourself. Uh, yeah. So we, uh, we like to call our, think of ourselves more like software as a service. Um, the, the cloud world might call us infrastructure as a service because we're providing lower level um, pieces um, and while you know, your application that's running on your, on your device is, is really yours and um, yeah. custom solution. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I've just talked about like just kind of API services and things like that as well, but I think that's a little reductive because it is, it is more uh, kind of broad based. And I think that's something we'll touch on a little later in this video. Um, yep. Could you yep. tell us a little bit about where we are currently and current capabilities in terms of prototyping, but also like you know, using SDKs and how that translates into what an EE or a firmware engineer might use today? Yeah, so from a you know, firmware engineer's perspective, we give you an SDK, it integrates with the hardware that you've designed, and through you know, basically commenting and uncommenting different libraries, you can enable uh, different cloud services that we, we provide for your devices. We call our, our device side stuff device SDKs, and we call our cloud stuff de um, device services, um, just to, to really hone in on uh, who's the intended audience. Um, and so you start with one of our SDKs, you, you build your core application, all the stuff you might want to do, talking to the sensors you want to talk to, doing any logic or algorithms on the device. And then the Goliath SDKs, it's kind of like this little agent that sits on top of, of the entire stack, doing the cloud connectivity and also shuffling the data between whatever code you wrote to whatever service you're trying to use with Goliath. And um, in terms of you know, where we are as a, as a product, you kind of asked, asked about it. Um, we're in beta right now, we're, as, as of this recording. And so we have one device SDK supporting one ecosystem. We'll talk more about that ecosystem in a minute. And a handful of uh, different device services, the kinds of things that we've heard over and over again that are super critical, even, even at the pilot stage. So things like software updates, uh, securing your communication, um, even getting device logs off the device so you can do some analysis while you're, you're deploying and, and monitoring your device. Things like that. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, and that is currently Zephyr stuff. You'll, if you go on the rest of YouTube where this uh, video is posted, you can see some of the demos and some of the tutorials that we've already posted around that and using some specific hardware as well. So ESP32, NR91 are early targets. And uh, yep. like you said, I mean, there's only like probably what, like four or five total devices and total software platforms people need, right? So we'll probably be done yeah. soon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that it's true and it's not true, right? Um, I know that's, for that's, you as, that was a bad joke. Sorry, <laughs> but but for you as an individual, like a company might actually have one stack. If like if you're an ST shop, you're probably going to do everything around ST, and if yeah. you're an Espresso shop, you're doing um, everything around Espresso. And that's one of the major things we heard over and over again from the hardware teams is that they need choice in hardware. So yeah. part of Goliath's 
vision is to support all the hardware that exists or that will exist through through our, our different SDKs. And so um, we have one SDK today, and it gives us a, a good breadth of devices because Zephyr, as an embedded operating system, has a broad support of like um, 200 different types of devices, several thousand boards, um, and adding uh, more of the time. And because right. we sit at the sort of network layer um, part of the stack, we can basically run on all those devices. And um, we've tested, like you mentioned, Nordic parts, uh, Espresso parts, ST parts, um, and we're validating more and more that are already in uh, Zephyr. Yeah. And as more chipset vendors add support in Zephyr, we can just enable that through through Goliath because of the fact that we're um, leveraging the ecosystem. Yeah, I, it is pretty trippy to be able to just like pop out a, uh, you know, if you have the same kind of form factor, if you say you had like a, you know, a NRF 91 feather, like Jared uh, makes, Jared Wolf makes, so then you pop in like a ESP32 huzzah, in theory, it's really just, you know, it's a, literally a switch on the command line. It's like, oh, now it's Wi-Fi based. And because in the software, it's a, you know, basically the network interface is a sa the same kind of API internally, then it's like, oh, it's cellular and then it's Wi-Fi and, then, you know, and on and on and on. That's kind of the idea of an OS anyways, but, uh, but the promise of that in embedded has been uh, elusive in the past, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, in for IoT, uh, you know, operating systems make sense. If you're building uh, low cost, um, let's say, uh, industrial controllers that are not connected, maybe you don't use an OS. But primarily, almost all IoT applications have some form of an OS. And so, by by leveraging the fact that you're probably going to be using an OS. We can build our SDKs on top of different OSs that people want to use. So in the future, we'll add more OSs as support. Um, but that that OS layer is is awesome, right? There are thousands of people making sure that the abstraction for the the UARTs are abstracted, and um, even sensors and sensor frameworks. So you can literally just pop out a uh, Wi-Fi and, and drop in a, in a cellular. And quite frankly, that's that's what I saw a lot of my my career. Uh, companies prototyping on a Wi-Fi device for cost and efficiency, and just you know scaling out for the engineering team, and then doing the last revs on a cellular device, especially from a, a software perspective. Um, yeah. And we, we actually have, we have this great demo that we did at the um, uh, previous Zephyr Summit, Developer Summit, where we had the exact same application running on an ESP32 uh, on the NRF9160 Feather from Nordic, so Wi-Fi and cellular. Then we also had an STM32 as a host processor, so that's where Zephyr was running, and an ESP8266 as a co network, network coprocessor. Um, and we're, we're able to play around with these different hardware configurations, which again, just makes it uh, super flexible from an OS perspective. And our SDK means you can just swap out different ones and use the same services. Yeah, that's really great. And yeah, I think that that same kind of thing then will become extensible outside of just Zephyr in the future as well. That's other SDKs like you mentioned. So uh, that's really great. I think another thing that I've heard, maybe, I think definitely in that first conversation I had with you, but also from other people is, is kind of flexibility when now you are interfacing to a different cloud and being able to not be locked in. You know, some OSs are very tightly integrated with cloud services as well. Yep. And so yep. how does that end up working with Goliath? And then how does that translate into future kind of operational type side of things? Yeah, yeah. And uh, what's great is if you're the R&D team, the hardware team, the company is relying on you to pick the chip and the architecture and the capabilities that you can or cannot do within your budget. But then the moment you say, okay, well, we're going to use uh, Stack X, they, your CISO or your IT team or your cloud architect looks at where Stack X is hosted. It's like, ah, we're all, we're all Azure. Uh, and that's hosted on yeah, someone else. We're an Azure uh, shop, right? Yeah. yeah, we're an Azure shop, um, which is totally reasonable, right? Like the, there's probably core parts of your business that cannot move off of Azure. Um, but it's actually impacted your ability to deploy and choose, let's say, another provider. And so that I mentioned about sort of the things we heard over and over again. One on the uh, hardware side, being able to have flexibility on the types of devices, the types of connectivity, um, but also on the operational side and the, and the sort of integration side, being able to run it on anyone's cloud is also another big piece of the feedback we got. Um, and just the architecture of Goliath from day one has been with this lens of, well, if you're an Azure shop, it probably should be able to run on Azure. Or if you're serving the Chinese market, it probably should be on AliCloud. Um, but also, if you have an IT closet and you need to have a local environment and not talk to one of those, those providers, we should be able to do that too. Or an oil refinery that has no internet connection, right? Um, yeah. And so part of the architecture of Goliath is that choice in hardware, choice in connectivity, but also choice in deployment. 
And so longer term, we're talking about where we're going, is uh, we'll have these distribution models uh, that support all, all those kinds of use cases as well. Yeah, yeah that, that seems like, uh, that's kind of the thing where it's like, if you're planning from day one, if you know that you're actually going to deploy a million devices, I feel like the whole conversation changes. Whereas if it's like, well, I'm just trying this thing out and you know, I'm prototyping based on what's out there, what's fast to turn, what looks good for my boss, that sort of thing. And like, you're just trying to get something out there but sometimes those take off and then you're locked in. And so not having that lock in is really important. Yeah. And uh, again, if, if we're talking about the hardware developer, right, the hardware team, even at huge companies where you might have a budget, you have no control over the rest of the company. That's right. So yeah. you may have had to design a system it's working great for you. And maybe we build it from scratch because yeah, um, right. switching right. between these verticalized solutions, you know, as, as it goes, is tough. Maybe they don't support your particular hardware. Maybe they only support a particular type of radio technology and you would have to basically throw away the entire product and start from scratch. So, um, yeah, having that flexibility, um, is, is going to be huge. Yeah, totally. Well, is there anything else we should know about Goliath that, uh, we haven't already talked about here? I mean, we've talked kind of what Goliath is, how it's currently serving the market, how it will future serve the market. Is there any other things that you normally talk about when you're, you know, pitching Goliath to, to different people and, and how, how they might get benefit from it? Yeah. You know, uh, our goal and what drives us is to empower hardware teams. Um, and we want the outcome of Goliath to make electrical engineers, uh, firmware engineers, and that, that rogue mechanical engineer to be empowered with a technology that was built for them. So you could build it on your, by yourself without having to get extra budget or convince your, your buddy at your company to build a little server for you or for you to stop working on the thing. So we would love people to, to try Goliath. Um, mm. we're in, we're in beta now We're uh, we're giving access to anyone who, who wants to give us um, feedback or has an idea for a company or, or a use case in their own um, business. And, uh, yeah, and definitely check out the website, sign up for the beta list. Um, we'd love your feedback. And if you want to talk to us on the phone, we'd be happy to schedule some time, even just to learn your pain points, building, building products today. Um, and of course, uh, you know, all, all is welcome. Um, we, we would love also people to actually try it with some hardware. So if you don't have hardware and that's what's stopping you from trying Goliath, let us know. We'll, we'll, we'll ship you some devices. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we'd love to hear what you think. Yeah. People can email devrel at goliath.io and that'll come to us and we'll get you, get you the stuff you need. John, thanks for cool. joining us here today and, uh, explaining Goliath and we'll be having more videos here on the Goliath YouTube channel and elsewhere on the web. Awesome. Thanks, Chris.